All right, good morning. All right. So as we uh, kind of set off on our Lenten journey, I'm excited to go on this journey with you. It's something that a lot of churches have kind of fallen out of ryth- rhythm with in, in sort of celebrating the season of Lent, and it's something that at Glory Day that I'm super proud of, and I love being able to do that, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, but mainly because, you know, to get to Easter and to get that celebration of, the, of Jesus coming out of that tomb and just praising God that he is alive is made so much greater after you've gone through Good Friday, right? I remember there was this couple I was doing premarital for, and I got to walk with them through a lot of this premarriage process. I got to hear about all the things they were going through of plans and in-laws and this and that, and just all of the things. So when we got to the wedding day, I really could sink in with them, where it was like, yay, you made it, right? Because I, I was part of that journey to that point. Lent is our journey to the empty tomb. And, and the empty tomb is made that much more amazing when we go to that step of the realization that it was for our ugliness that Jesus had to die in the first place. That when we're willing to look in that mirror to see ourselves and to say it was for that evil that Jesus endured the cross I don't know about you, but that makes that pretty spectacular. Amen? Amen. Yeah, so I, I, I really hope that you and, and, and you yourself or as a family really kind of w- move through this season together. And throughout the entire season, we're going to be looking at what it means to follow Jesus. That to be a Christian is another way of saying that we are those who are devoted, we are focused, we are committed to the person and the life of Jesus Christ solely. The title of Christian was not something that the early followers of Jesus thought of themselves. In fact, it was it was the outside world that called them Christians. And to be a Christian means to be a mini Christ, a little Christ. So you have people outside the church looking in on the church and going, oh yeah, there are a bunch of little Jesuses. That so who we are, even in the title, the label of saying, I am a Christian, is to say that my life is solely devoted, focused on, and committed to the person of Jesus Christ. And if it is committed, devoted, or focused on anything else, that Jesus then has the power to come convict me of that, to bring me back to who I truly am, and that is a follower of of him. Right? So, I mean, this is what it says in Mark 1.15. This is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry as he's calling these people to come after him. He says, the time was fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, repent and believe in the gospel. Right? The gospel being the good news that Jesus was there. That God sent his son into the world. That's the good news, the gospel. And and what Jesus says is repent and believe that. So to repent means I'm going to change my mind. That I was headed this way and I repent, I change my mind, and now I'm going to head this way. We do this with lots of things. I consistently have to repent of my love of donuts. I still want to believe they are good for me. Right? And because it has the word apple in it, it makes it like some de facto health food, right? I I ignore the fritter part, but we do this with lots of things. Lots of things where we, and, and I'm sure in the course of your life, you can think of ways that you repented of a certain way of thinking. And then, and then what you notice is that upon repenting, changing your mind, changing your focus, what comes after that is a change of attitude, a change of behavior. So the only way to change your life is it starts with repentance. Repentance is not groveling. Repentance is the changing of mind. So Jesus says the time is at hand. 
I am here. The kingdom of God is here. Therefore, change your way of thinking. Change your mind. Take my hand. Believe in me. Believe in the gospel. He says the, the same thing to the, to the early disciples. He says, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Or later on to Matthew, the tax collector, he comes to the booth, he says, in these simple, powerful words, follow me. Now Matthew had a choice. He could stay at that booth. But within the invitation is Jesus saying that in order to follow me, you're going to have to leave behind what you thought your life was going to be like. You're going to have to leave behind what you thought was most important. Matthew could have stayed at the booth. He had a nice cushy job. Make a little money. But then we wouldn't have had the gospel of Matthew. The invitation of Jesus is on every single one of us, and I think it's on us all the time. The question is, is will we follow him? Will we be sensitive to his voice and follow him? And so that, that's what we're walking through this entire Lenten season. Now, the reality for all of us who have the Holy Spirit, remember, you can't say that Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'll, I'll run the assumption, Holy Spirit is right here in this room inside each and every one of you that confess Jesus as Lord. And the Holy Spirit that's within us, this is what the Holy Spirit's going to be doing, is leading you into greater and greater depths of the character, of the person of Jesus Christ. That the goal of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify you into the image, into the person of Jesus. So that His character becomes your character. His values become your values. That how he thinks becomes how you think. Who he loves becomes how you love. That he becomes you. That you are connected to him and him in you. That as you abide in Christ, Christ abides in you and you will bear much fruit. But apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. And so the goal of the Holy Spirit is to make you more like Jesus. Isn't that phenomenal? It's exciting. But I'm telling you right now, it is so difficult. Because that is the last thing your sinful nature wants. As we change, as we repent, as we follow Jesus, the byproduct will be a change of focus Changes of attitudes, our behaviors, our goals, a change of how we define a successful life, an enriching life, a rewarding life. All of it changes as you follow Jesus. So, so today what we're leaning into is really the foundational teaching that Jesus will be leading his disciples, his followers, into a life that is marked by sacrificial love. So let's start this conversation out. Let's kick it off by looking at a particular viewpoint of, well, in my opinion, people, uh, a group of people in our society that I think they understand love pretty well. Let's check out this video. Love is like over a gillion stuff. Helping someone even if you don't want to. When your parents or your teachers don't tell you to. Giving away stuff that you really, really like. If they want your toys, I'll share. Sale. Toys. It's smiling and saying good things about them. I should say, you have very nice clothes on. I hope my mommy. I played with another person on the playground when she didn't have anybody to play with. And people that are living to me feel like I should do it to someone else. Because Jesus did the same for us. It's like your daughter says you will have them do to you. That you should treat the other one just like I've been treated before. Not like bad, but the kind that have been good treated. 
Nobody really wants to play with somebody who's been mean. Being kind is helping those in need. Give them some food. Get fish and bread and green beans and peas and apples. I'll ask my mom and or dad. Can we go get food for this hungry person that I found? Um, what is <laughs> hugging your mom and helping her wash the dishes? I just get the water thing and just spray them. People show me love by holding my hand. And they also give me a kiss from the head when I'm asleep very lightly. There's people that don't get love in other places of the world. You help them. Just help people. If we show people love, they can spread it all around the world. Isn't that adorable? I was so convicted. That kid, he's like, eats so much better than all of us. I'm like, I, showing love is peas and carrots. I'm like, oh, okay. I already, already brought up the donut part. But. but from the perspective of kids, I like the very simple, straightforward message. Just help people. Just be kind. That nobody likes people who are mean. Just that real straightforward encouragement from kids. Now, it's one thing to get the perspective on love from the kids, and it's great. And it's a whole other thing to get it from God himself and that perspective. And so, if you would, open up to 1 John, and we're going to be working through um, a good chunk of chapter 4 to get the full treatment of the origins of love, the source of love, what love is, from God himself who is love. Now, as you're turning there, uh, something that's important is, you know, throughout, John's known as the gospel of love. Not only in the gospel of John, but in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He uses the word agape more than anyone else. And, And agape means sacrificial in nature. So the love he's talking about is the kind of love, it's not just an emotion, it's an action. It's an action of saying, I could do something else, but I choose to act on your behalf. I'm I'm choosing to. It's a decision. That's important to remember because we live in a society that's made it so much about our feelings. Well, I don't feel like, I don't feel, I don't feel. Do you know what scripture says about our feelings? They are not to be trusted. And in fact, the seat of the heart is the seat of all kinds of wickedness. Man, don't trust your feelings. Feelings will lead you astray. Here's what you trust. You trust the voice of Jesus as he's going to call you to consistently make decisions of the betterment of other people. That's agape. So even the word beloved comes from the root word of agape, meaning those of you who have been agape loved by God. So in 1 John, starting this thing off here in, in verse 7, John says, Beloved, those who have been agape Let us agape one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not agape love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest amongst us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us this way, we also ought to love one another. For no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Okay, let's pause there. So so John's holding up for us all the greatest example of agape love that ever has been and ever will be, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. And he's saying that true love is this, that Jesus laid down his life for you. That if you're ever struggling to have the motivation to love, as Christians, where do we go? We always go to the cross that that's what God did for me. And if God did that for me, then, then I'm going to go love others. I, I can do that. Like if God could forgive me, who in your life can you not forgive? 
that if God could love you, then who in your life are you going to say, but I can't love them? Because what if God did that to us? What if he looked at you and said, you know what, I can't do it. You're just, I, I don't agree with you. I don't like you. I don't like what you're about. I'm not loving you. What if God did that to us? John's argument is he didn't do that to us. That the cross stands as the proof of what God did for us. Therefore, treat others the same way. John even says God becomes visible on earth as we love one another and his love being perfected in us. Let me give you a visible moment when I saw the love of God. So I was, uh, I, I, I had a, I saw this video, and you can check it out. I think it's on YouTube, but it's a video of a Russian soldier that was captured by the Ukrainian people. And this Russian soldier's been captured. Now, I want you to put yourself in those shoes. I'm sure you've been watching the news. I'm sure you've been inundated with it. How would you treat that Russian soldier if you were in the shoes of those Ukrainian people? I mean, let's, can we be real here? How many of you want to kick the crud out of that Russian soldier? Really? Liars. You're telling me if there's an invading army rolling towards your city, annihilating everything you know, what do you want to do? I watched that video, and, and, and here's what struck me. You know, what they, you know how they responded to this Russian soldier? They went and got him bread. They made for him a glass of hot tea. And then they even called his mom so that his mom would know that he was okay. And as he's talking to his mom and he's drinking the tea and he's eating this bread surrounded by these Ukrainian people, th this young man, I think he was like 19, he just breaks down in tears. And I'll be honest with you, as I'm watching the video, so did I. Because in a moment, when every one of those Ukrainian people would be complete, and I'm not saying every Ukrainian person's like this. I said in this situation, those Ukrainian people would have been, in my viewpoint, completely justified to have been treating this young man in a very particular kind of way. And instead, they made a choice. And they loved him. That's the kind of love that Jesus will be working in our lives. It's a very distinctive type of love that John says the Holy Spirit is going to be empowering within us as followers of Jesus. This is what he means in verse 13 when he says this, By this we know that we abide in Jesus and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. Verse 14, And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Verse 16, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us because God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And by this is love that is perfected within us that we have no fear on the day of judgment. For there's no fear in love because fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but they hate their brother or sister, then they are a liar. For, for he or she who does not love their brother or sister whom they see cannot love their God who they cannot see. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love their brother and sister. See, the Holy Spirit is going to be producing in us, followers of Jesus, a very distinctive kind of love. 
People ask me a, a lot, you know, what, what's, what's God up to in my life? Or what's the Holy Spirit? How do I know when it's the Holy Spirit at work in my life? And my answer is always, it's always very straightforward. And honestly, it's not that complex. What the Holy Spirit is going to be empowering you to do is leading you to greater and greater depths of your love of God and your love of other people. Because the Holy Spirit wants to make you like Jesus. And Jesus was perfected in his love of his Father and the love of others. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is going to be empowering you to love God and love others to greater and greater depths. It's going to be radical. It's going to be different. It's going to, it's going to shock the world how much we love people. I'll tell you what the Holy Spirit will not be doing empowering you to love yourself. So if the end game of your life is about you, the Holy Spirit will not be empowering that. The revelations that the Holy Spirit will be doing in your life is going to lead you to a greater love of, of God, meaning it's not about me, it's about Him, and a greater love of others because I'm going to see how much God loves me and that's going to empower me to say, man, i got to give that love away, is what John is saying. Let me give you the overarching argument that, John, that John's making here in chapter 4. He's saying this. He goes, first off, God is love. The nature of God is love. Like the sun gives light because the sun is light. Fire gives heat because fire is heat. God gives love because God is is love. The sun will never shine darkness. A fire will never put off icicles. God will never make a decision that is not loving. Ever. All right, you can wrestle with it all day. And trust me, I have a lot. Because I'll tell you the one thing that deceives me constantly are my eyeballs. Because I look at things in the world and I go, how is that loving? Really, God? What about that? What about that? What about that? But what John is telling us is that the very nature of the God we worship is a God of agape love, a God of sacrifice. That he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And when he's also a wrathful God on sin, on the things of evil, see, the, the difficulty we have in following Jesus is that in order to follow Jesus, you can't have this inherent need to where you have to be in control. I remember one time we went on a, on a hike as a family and my daughter was at an age where she had no clue where we were going, but she constantly had to be in front. So she would walk and then she would stop and she'd go, am I going the right way? And I would be like, uh, kind of, you got to, and then she'd walk and then she'd stop and look back and stop and look back. And at a certain point I go, why don't you just walk back here and I'll show you where we need to go. And she goes, yeah, but then I have to walk behind you. And in that moment, I was like, that's probably been the majority of my life trying to follow Jesus. In order to follow Jesus, it has to be about him. It can't be about you, because otherwise I'm just leading up ahead and turning my shoulder going, is this where I'm supposed to go? And he's like, how about you just follow me? I'll lead you right where you need to go. Yeah, but, yeah, but then i got to be second fiddle. No, 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 I'm lead chair, Jesus. See, the primary quality Jesus is going to lead you to is going to be leading you into a life 
where you're going to be marked by the sacrificial love that you give away to other people. Because God is love. And then the second argument that, that, that John is making is those who have been born of God and know God are God's children. So third, God's children are going to have his divine nature of love. So consequently, fourth, God's children will love. Notice that it's not like that we're going to make a choice to. It's going to be, your nature is to love. Because he's placed his divine nature inside of you. You were remade by Jesus to be his extension of love in this world. It's who you are. When we have Compassion International, or, we, 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 or if we're going to go help people in Winterset, or we're going to donate to matters in Ukraine, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do this, all we're doing as a church, we're not trying to nickel and dime you. We're just giving you opportunity to be who you are. You are love. We don't just choose to love. You are love because God is love and he lives in you. So de facto, you as God's child are love. Is that a phenomenal truth? That is exactly what John is saying. Now here, let me tell you why this is so challenging in our lives because our sinful nature wants, wants to hate. We want to fight. We want to be right. We want to burn bridges. We want to hate our enemies. It feels good. It feels justified. Our sinful nature loves to gossip. Oh, it loves to slander loves to lie, loves to sneak and get away with it. It loves to just be about our own self. We crave it. We long for it. And right now, in your flesh, there is a battle that is waged between your sinful nature and the power of the Holy Spirit making you like Jesus. And if you feel stalled out, I will guarantee you that there is some blockage that Jesus needs to push his way through. Something in your life you're not submitting to him. Some area of your life you're saying, you can have all of me, just not that. Jesus will have all of you. He will. And he's relentless. He will not give up on you. He will keep coming after you saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. Repent, repent, repent. Change your thinking, change your mind. Because our sinful nature, if we follow our sinful nature, we're also gonna have to stiff arm things like joy and peace and hope and passion, and compassion, and love. Because they don't coexist. But as we abide in Christ, more importantly, as Christ abides in us, then the fruit that we bear is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it's all the things we, we want in our life. The Spirit of Jesus is going to be leading us into greater and greater depths of love. I, I remember last spring, not this spring, I don't know if we've had it yet. We had like three days of it, right? But like last spring, there was this time we had the windows open and it was in the morning. And, and I remember it was just a really, I don't know, you guys ever have mornings that are just like, it's like your day starts chaotic, right? Some of you were like, yeah, every day, right? But it was just loud. It was just a lot going on. And I remember my daughter, she was like, Daddy, do you hear the birds? And I was like, what? No, what? And I'm doing something. She's like, Daddy, do you hear the birds? I'm like, what? It's fine. And like, Daddy, do you hear the birds? And finally, I'm like, what is it, honey? 
And she's like, listen. And I had to like, pa- like really, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. She goes, come here. And she led me over to the window, and, and we listened to the birds. The voice of the Holy Spirit is constantly talking to us. Like those birds were chirping out the window. And sometimes, through the eyes of a child, we have to be able to be still and know that he is God. We have to be able to maybe say no to some noise and some clutter in order to listen so that we can hear the beautiful voice of what God is leading us towards and what he's saying to us. Some of you in this room right now need the conviction and the realization that I think you might, maybe you've made Christianity into something that it's not. And you left Jesus behind. And you've been trying to push forward and make your own decisions and cut your own way through this world. And, and, and maybe it's just not working. Or maybe it is, but to your detriment. And maybe there's some of you in here today that need the encouragement where you've been really struggling to love, to forgive someone, to love someone, to be there for someone. And here I get to come alongside you and I say, keep struggling in that because it's not easy to love like Jesus. Don't think it was easy for Jesus to love us. I know what it's like to love me. Not easy. And to love like Jesus is going to be hard. You think it was easy for those Ukrainian people to bring out bread and tea and serve this? No, but they did it. And that's the kind of love we're called to. It's hard. How do you know when you're loving someone the way that Jesus would be loving them? Here, here's your tip. Tip and trick time. Ready? It's sacrificial in nature. It's hard. It's uncomfortable. We don't like it. Think it's easy to pray for your enemies, to do good for them? No, it's hard. It's painful. But Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. It's hard. But Jesus says, this is the narrow road I call you to. So follow me. Lean into the uncomfortableness of it. But understand that as you follow me and as you love others the way I loved you, then and only then will you discover who and whose you truly are. Jesus has given his church this command. A new commandment I give to you. That you are to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, people will know that you belong to me if you have love for one another. It's an incredible adventure to follow Jesus. And I pray that this next week and for the rest of your life until you're in the kingdom of God, that you will be following Jesus, being led by love, and know that God is with you every step of the way. Amen.